So I wanted us to piggyback off the previous video that we discussed on septic shock and sepsis and wanted to discuss anaphylaxis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? We're on the road to 16,000 subscribers. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at anaphylaxis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Now, remember that anaphylaxis is very, very important because there are some people that have many allergies to many different things. They react to different things. They react to dust, they react to pollen, they react to certain chemicals in foods, they react to certain medications, especially with penicillins, it's very common. Anaphylaxis is a potential life-threatening condition as it has some implication to limit the airway and cause some airway obstruction and most patients are going to die from this. So remember that this is going to be defined as an acute life-threatening or potentially life-threatening IgE-mediated allergic reaction. And one key thing to note is that, number one, this is an IgE-mediated allergic reaction, very similar to what happens in asthma. And it's going to be happening in an individual that is pre-sensitized, such that when the individual is re-exposed to the sensitizing agents, then they develop these characteristic features. Now, the big difference between anaphylaxis and an anaphylactoid reaction is that in terms of anaphylactoid reactions, they are not IgE-mediated, so they, are, they will not need any prior sensitization. And generally, whenever the inciting agent is exposed to this patient, they'll present you with those symptoms at first exposure. And though clinically they're going to be indistinguishable and even the management is largely going to be the same. So the anaphylactoid reactions are going to be happening when you stimulate mast cells via the immune complexes that activate the complement system. And remember that these mast cells are going to be found lining the GIT, they're going to be found lining the respiratory system, they're going to be found in the skin, they're going to be found lining blood vessels. And once they release their preformed mediators of inflammation, these are going to be resulting in these characteristic features or characteristic changes that we often see in the patient that has either anaphylaxis or anaphylactoid reactions. In terms of anaphylaxis, remember that the IgE antibodies are going to be coating the mast cells, they're going to be coating the basophils. And when these antibodies are cross-linked, this gives the signal for the mast cells to degranulate the, and release their chemicals, histamine, heparin, and some other inflammatory reactions to kick into place. So certain triggers and etiology of anaphylactic reactions or anaphylaxis include drugs like beta-lactam antibiotics, very common with penicillins. I actually have a sister that has a penicillin allergy. It's a very common, almost a, a huge population actually has a penicillin reaction, but most of them are mild. We also have other drugs like insulin, streptokinase, allergic allergen extracts, some foods like nuts, eggs, and seafood, which is why whenever you're taking a history, especially for patients that are going to theater, you want to ask them if they have an egg allergy because propofol has some egg extracts in it. So if you give it to a patient that has egg allergies, you may cause a disaster. Certain proteins like tetanus antitoxoid, blood transfusions, animal venoms, latex, and remember that in healthcare workers that have a, do not have a history of atopy uh, or those that you can't really identify any identifiable cause that is triggering the allergy, you should suspect that possibly this is because of a latex allergy. Peanuts and latex allergens can actually be airborne and occasionally exercise and even cold exposure can trigger or contribute to an anaphylactic reaction. And remember that you having a history of A to B does not increase the risk of anaphylaxis, but it's going to increase the risk of you dying when the anaphylaxis actually happens. Some other triggers for anaphylactoid reactions, remember these ones are not IgE mediated, things like iodated radiopec contrast, aspirin, other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti drugs, opioids, monoclonal antibodies, and even exercise. Now remember what's happening here. This is an IgE mediated condition. So whenever you're 
exposed to the antigen for the first time or the allergen for the first time, initially the antibody that gets produced is IgM, which is like a pentameric antibody. It doesn't really fit on the receptors that are found in the basophils and the muscles. But with subsequent exposure to the same allergen or the same antigen, you're going to be producing immunoglobulin E, which is going to be having certain receptors on the muscles, which are known as FC receptors, that are going to be binding on muscles, that are going to be binding on basophils, such that when these antibodies are cross-linked, this results in the release of these preformed mediators of inflammation, things like histamines, you also kick into place some certain inflammatory reactions producing things like leukotrienes and other mediators that are going to be causing these characteristic changes. One thing is that the smooth muscle are going to constrict. So it means that in the bronchioles, there's going to be bronchial constriction. In the GIT, there may be vomiting, there may be diarrhea. And then, of course, in the blood vessels, there's going to be vasodilatation with leakage of plasma. So this is what's contributing to the urticaria or the angioedema. And in terms of the clinical features, often they're going to begin within 15 minutes of exposure. So remember, the muscles cells are found everywhere. They're found in the skin, they're found in the upper and lower airways, they're found in the cardiovascular system, and even in the GIT. So you're going to see these clinical features in these systems. So when one or more areas are affected and the symptoms don't necessarily progress or from mild, like for example, if they have a urticaria to severe, where they have airway obstruction, they may have refractory shock, so sometimes they may have this, though each patient is going to be manifesting the same reaction to the subsequent exposure. Most patients may have cardiovascular collapse that can occur without respiratory or sometimes with respiratory symptoms. Cardiovascular collapse is also another big thing that may cause patients to die. Then all these things are happening in the early phase because of the preformed mediators of inflammation. Then later on, you may get some late phase reactions uh, about four to eight hours after exposure or later on, this is often when those inflammatory reactions come into play and you make those uh, slow-reacting substances of anaphylaxis. And remember that these signs and symptoms are usually less severe when they um, initially are going to be quite limiting and they're going to be limited to urticaria. However, they can be quite severe, they can be fatal, but in most patients they are not so severe, which is why we often cover them on some steroids to prevent any further reactions that we anticipate may happen later on. So the patients who have an anaphylactic reaction should actually be observed in an acute care setting for several hours, even after the initial reaction for this late phase reactions. Some of the symptoms, remember that they may range from mild to severe. You may have things like flushing, puritus, which is itching, urticaria, you may have sneezing, you may have rhinorrhea, you may have nausea, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, you may have a sense of choking or dyspnea, palpitations and dizziness. And in terms of the signs, this patient may be hypotensive, they may have tachycardia, they may have urticaria or the wheels, they may have angioedema, they may have wheezing, strider, cyanosis and syncope. And remember, shock can develop within minutes and the patients may actually have seizures and they may become unresponsive and they may die. The diagnosis is largely clinical because you won't really have that much time to actually order for investigations and wait for investigations because this comes in as a very acute thing. So it should be suspected if you have a patient presenting without any explanation with the following things. If they present in shock, if they present with respiratory symptoms like dyspnea, strider, wheezing, or even they have two or more other manifestations that are associated with anaphylaxis, things like angioedema, rhinorrhea, or even GI symptoms. Of course, they may sometimes even give you a history of being stung by a bee, history of being exposed to a food allergy, and they'll be brought into that state at your emergency department. So remember that there is a risk of rapid progression to shock. And so it means that there's no time for us to do certain tests. But though those that have mild um, equivocal cases, these ones actually you can confirm by ordering serum levels of tryptase. And preferably this should be collected within two hours of the reaction. So whenever someone is having this anaphylactic reaction, these levels tend to increase. And you can actually measure them to help confirm the diagnosis when it's unclear or if the symptoms recur even after you give them treatment with IV drugs. So like I said, in healthcare workers that have unexplained anaphylactic symptoms, always suspect a latex allergy, which is found in the gloves, some of the gloves that are bought by certain hospitals. Then, of course, the cause is going to be identified by taking a careful history. 
In terms of management, epinephrine is a cornerstone for management of anaphylaxis. Airway protection is very important. Sometimes you may require to intubate the patient, place this patient on IV fluids, and sometimes they may need vasopressors, especially if they're persistently hypotensive. Cover them on some antihistamines. You can sometimes nebulize them with inhaled beta agonists, um, especially if they have the bronchoconstriction. And remember that ideally anaphylactoid reactions, which are non-IgE mediated, are quite similar to anaphylactic reactions. Even the management is quite similar. So in terms of epinephrine, remember that this is a cornerstone of management of anaphylaxis. It's going to be used to relieve all the symptoms and signs that we see. It must be given immediately. You can either give it subcutaneously or you can give it as an intramuscular injection. But remember that in terms of intramuscular injection, the absorption is much fastest and greatest when you actually administer it in the mid-outer aspect of the thigh, so in the anterolateral aspect of the mid-thigh. So you can actually repeat the dose every 5 to 15 minutes and you're going to be getting 0.3 to 0.5 mils of a 0.1% solution. That's a 1 to 1,000 solution in adults. In children, you use 0.01 mils per kg body weight. And if the patient actually arrests and the, the heart stops, you follow the standard protocol for how you're going to be managing cardiac arrest. I'll do a separate video on how we manage cardiac arrest. If the patients then become hypotensive or they have severe airway obstruction, you can give them epinephrine IV or even intraosseous. And of course, a continuous drip using uh, an infusion pump is preferred. But if there's a delay to prepare this infusion pump, to prepare the drip, and you feel like it's going to take a long time, then the epinephrine can actually be given as a single bolus slowly about at a dose of 0.05 to 0.1 milligrams. That translates to about 0.5 to 1 mils of the 0.1 milligrams per mil. That's 1 to 10,000 um, solution over 1 to 2 minutes. So for those that are having the continuous IV drip of 1 milligram of epinephrine, we often mix it in 250 mils of 5% dextrose or normal saline for a continuous concentration of 4 micrograms per mil and then we started at 0.1 micrograms per kg per minute and we can actually even titrate it up to 0.05 micrograms per kg per minute we every two minutes or even three minutes based on how their blood pressure their heart rate and their oxygenation is so if the patient's weight cannot actually be determined then the recommended starting dose is going to be one to two micrograms per minute then we titrate upwards by two to four micrograms per minute every two to three minutes and if the initial bolus is desired but the IV access is delayed then you can have 0.2 to about 0.25 milligrams of epinephrine that can be given through the endotracheal tube so that's about 2 to 2.5 mils of the 0.1 milligram per mil solution diluted with about 5 to 10 mils of sterile water or saline alternatively a second dose of epinephrine IM can actually be given. In some patients, you do tend to give them glucagon. So you can give them glucagon 1 to 5 milligrams IV over 5 minutes. That's about 20 to 30 micrograms per kg body weight in children, followed by about 5 to 10 or rather 5 to 15 micrograms per minute infusion. And this is going to be needed for patients that are on beta blockers because remember that beta blockers do actually attenuate the effect of epinephrine. So there is some evidence that Patients that actually are on beta blockers are not going to be responsive to epinephrine. So uh, remember also with glucagon, give it slowly. If you give it too quickly, it may cause the patient to vomit. In terms of other treatment modalities, oxygenation and intubation is quite important. Remember that this is going to be recommended for those that have strider and are wheezing and are quite unresponsive to epinephrine. But from my past experience, most patients actually do tend to respond quite well to epinephrine then early intubation is actually going to be recommended. And you don't want to wait for epinephrine to kick in before you actually decide that this patient needs to be intubated because you may actually be too late and the edema may have progressed and it may actually even prevent you from performing your intubation and you may require a cricothyrotomy. For patients that are hypotensive, it will often resolve when you give them epinephrine. If they are persistently hypotensive, you may treat them with one to two liters that's about 20 to 40 mils per kg in children of isotonic fluids, such as normal saline. And of course, the hypotension that is refractory to IV fluids, as well as IV epinephrine, may require vasopressors such as dopamine, 5 micrograms per kg per minute. 
Cover this patient on an antihistamine, preferably an H1 and an H2 blocker that should be given every six hours until the symptoms resolve. An H1 blocker such as diphenhydramine can be given about 50 to 100 milligrams IV. In some cases, promethazine is what we often find in most of our hospitals. Cimetidine can also be given 300 milligrams IV. Then, of course, inhaled corticosteroids sometimes can help with the bronchoconstriction that may persist despite you giving this patient epinephrine. So albuterol can be used to nebulize this patient continuously but with about 5 to 10 milligrams. Corticosteroids have no proven benefit, especially in the early phase, but we still do give them to prevent that late phase that I talked about. So methylprednisolone 125 milligrams IV initially is adequate, or we can give them the oral prednisolone. But when they come in, we often give them a jab of hydrocortisone. In terms of prevention, remember you should avoid the known triggers. So that's the primary prevention that is there. If you can not avoid the triggers, then desensitization can be done. So this is where the inciting agent is introduced in small amounts, in small concentrations to this person such that you can stimulate the body to make IgG. Now the IgG that you're making is going to be competing with the IgE and prevent the IgE from binding on the mast cells. That's the whole principle behind desensitization. So the patients with uh, the anaphylactic reactions to the radio opaque contrast agents should actually not be re-exposed to it. And then when the exposure is absolutely necessary, make sure that you give them three doses of prednisone, 50 milligrams orally every six hours. Starting about 18 hours before the procedure, give them diphenhydramine, 50 milligrams orally one hour before the procedure. And of course, the evidence to support the efficacy of this modality is actually quite limited. Those patients that have anaphylactic reactions to insect stings, foods, or other known substances should actually wear an alert bracelet and should carry a pre-filled self-injecting epinephrine syringe, which contains about 0.3 milligrams in adults and 0.15 milligrams in children, and oral antihistamines so that they can treat themselves whenever these symptoms happen, whenever they eat a food that they are allergic to or these are stung by an insect that they are allergic to. If a severe reaction actually occurs in these patients, advise them that they must come in as quickly as possible to the emergency department and there they should be closely monitored and treated and these can be repeated and adjusted depending on the response of the patient. I really hope you enjoy this video on anaphylaxis. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazebu. Until next time, bye-bye.